Welcome back to another episode of Four Expedition Adventurer. In this episode, we venture out to Silver City, New Mexico and the surrounding Gila Wilderness area. We check into the New Mexico cabin rentals at Double E Ranch and explore the surrounding area in the land of Aldo Leopold. The next episode of Four Expedition Adventure starts now. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Four Expedition Adventure. I'm Scott Luthold. This is another installment of my Pursuit of Cabin Living series. I don't have a lot of videos in this series right now, so I thought I'd come out here to a ranch in southwestern New Mexico and spend a little bit of time out here and capture some footage and create another episode for this series. I hope you enjoy it. I'm in an area just northwest of the town of Silver City, and Silver City is an, an old historic mining town that has been transformed over the last probably 20 years into a very eclectic artsy town. If you go downtown Silver City, which I'll probably show you here on this, on this trip and in this video, there's a lot of art galleries that have sprung up, a lot of coffee shops and great little restaurants and things like that. And I've wanted to come over here and check out Silver City and the surrounding area for many, many years, probably close to 30 years. But for some reason, I just never made it this far east uh, from the town of Safford in Arizona, which is another couple of hour drive east of Safford. Uh, but I decided to come out here and check it out this time. I've got a, a list of things that I've wanted to explore ever since I discovered this region uh, many, many years ago, and I'm knocking those things off my list. I'm sharing most of those with you. It's really beautiful out here. I'm on a ranch probably about 45 minutes northwest of Silver City in the town of Gila. Gila is spelled G-I-L-A. And I'm out here on this ranch. It's an Airbnb cabin, and it's a, it's a really great working ranch. Originally was more than 30,000 acres, and it's been pared back uh, over the years and sold off parts of it. It's just a really beautiful place to be out here. Apparently, this, uh, from what I understand, this used to be a dude ranch, so that's pretty cool. One of the things that really intrigues me about this area that I've always wanted to, uh, the reason I've always wanted to explore it is because the Gila Wilderness is um, widely known as the first wilderness area um, preservation in the United States and probably the world. And there's a gentleman named Aldo Leopold that was responsible for working with the National Forest Service to preserve this region and call it the, the Gila Wilderness Area. And of course, since then, there's been many wilderness areas protected, not only here in the States, but around the world. So uh, Aldo Leopold pulled later on in life, ended up living in Wisconsin and working for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so I have a lot of connection to his story because I'm originally from Wisconsin myself. And of course, I'm very connected to the Southwest. So it's really uh, special for me to be out here right now and, and really exploring the region that he found so valuable to protect. Anyhow, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And it's, it's a really nice way for me to come out here and just relax and experience a real peaceful environment and share that all with you. If you haven't become a subscriber to my channel, I encourage you to become one. Of course, be sure to hit that notification bell to be notified when videos go live. And if you'd like to support 4Expedition, go to 4Expedition.com, go to the store. We have a lot of really cool things in there you can buy. And if you'd like to become a member of Team 4X, go to 4Expedition.com slash join to learn more. I really look forward to sharing this episode with you, so sit back and enjoy the ride. San Carlos Indian Reservation right now. <clears throat> just left the town of Globe, as you just saw, heading over toward Safford. And many of you may recall the last time I passed through here, I was filming a two-part series called The Overland Trip to Everywhere. I came through here and explored around the San Carlos Reservoir. And um, then I got over to Safford and headed straight south down to the Chiricahua National Monument. However, Today, 
instead of turning right and turning south at Safford, which is also where Mount Graham is, I'm going to continue east into New Mexico. And I've never been on the road past Safford before, and I'm heading over to Silver City and over to the Gila Mountain Range. <clears throat> and I've lived in Arizona for about 35 years, and I've always wanted to go over to Silver City and explore that region, so I'm going to do that today. And in fact, the last time I passed through here in San Carlos and um, passing through Safford, I think I recall mentioning that I wanted to take that trip sometime soon. So I'm doing that, and uh, it's going to be a really great four-day experience. I'm going to be staying in a little ranch cabin at the base of the Gila Mountains, and Gila is spelled G-I-L-A. It's um, the Gila River passes from the Gila Mountain Range all the way across the state of Arizona over to the Colorado River. So it's a pretty significant riverway that passes through a number of Native American reservations and um, and provides uh, water resources to a lot of communities. Anyhow, it should be a really great trip, and um, it's about a six-hour drive from Phoenix, so I'm heading over. I left around 8 o'clock this morning in Phoenix, and I'm uh, hopefully going to arrive over there around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, get settled, and um, do some exploring around that area. My ankle's healed up pretty well. I do still have a little bit of a uh, tendonitis that I'm dealing with, but uh, I think it should suffice to say that um, it's good enough to get out there and do some exploring. So I'm really looking forward to this and looking forward to sharing it with you. Look at that. Very nice. Very well equipped and appointed. Much nicer than some of the other cabins I've stayed in for this series. From what I understand, the floor is heated. Comfortable. Nice little kitchen.
It's incredibly peaceful out here. There's not a single sound. There's a slight breeze. It's pretty chilly. Marcus, when I first arrived, told me that it's been getting down into the 20s at night. So it'll probably be a pretty chilly evening. Apparently the cabin floor is heated, but it doesn't seem to be heating up very quickly. Might be a chilly night's sleep. What a beautiful little valley. It's very protected. We had to drop in on the main driveway, drop straight down into this valley, so it's it's pretty um it's pretty surrounded by mountains all the way around. Stun the sun is starting to set over here. You can see. Pretty soon the stars will come out. I'm sure the stars will be very bright. What a nice little place they've happened upon here. Well, good morning. Had a good night's sleep, decided to sleep in a little bit. The uh, the cabin has radiant floor heat, so it took a while for that to heat up, so I was pretty chilly. I had to sleep in my sleeping bag last night, but now it's, now it's up there in uh, the high 60s in there. But I got up this morning and decided to take a walk and walk around the, the ranch here and shoot some really nice little videos. pretty chilly out this morning. I think it was probably in the 20s this morning when I got up. Opened up the door to come out here and decided, eh, I think I'll stay inside for a little longer. It's very, very peaceful out here. There's, um, one, two, three, I think there's five cabins here, and, um, turns out they're all occupied. There's some people from California, there's somebody from New York, um, of course I'm from Arizona. Looks like maybe there's somebody from Oregon. People come out here and spend extended periods of time, from what I understand, after talking to Marcus and Holly, the owners. They were telling me that uh, some people have come out here and booked for two, three months straight. And uh, they're able to work remotely, and they literally live out here, coming from California or New York or something like that. And just kind of settling in here and in this remote, peaceful environment and still able to work remotely. There's Wi-Fi here. It's a beautiful morning. I think probably I'm going to get in the truck and head a little bit further north. There's a couple of interesting things I want to see. There's the town of um, uh, Mogollon, which is a ghost town. And then there's this thing called the Catwalk, which is a really cool hiking trail that goes through this canyon. I'll probably go and check those two things out today. And then uh, otherwise just, just kind of chill out. I think sometime this week... Uh, I think I'm going to see if I if um, Marcus and Holly would like to be interviewed to talk about why it is they decided to buy out here. They've only been here a month. They came from Houston, and uh, they happened upon this place. And uh, 
found out that it was for sale and ended up buying it. But I think it'd be really nice to talk to them a little bit about uh, why they decided to leave the city and move out here. Maybe inspire a few of you that are watching this to do the same. All right, so I think we're gonna head out and check out a couple things like I mentioned earlier. Go up to the catwalk and check out the town of Mugion. Should be a good, uh, good time. Man, it's still pretty chilly out, but it's sunny out. Well, we're hiking in Whitewater Canyon, and there's a, a real unique recreation area here called the catwalk. And the catwalk is something that I've seen on New Mexico maps for years. I always thought it'd be pretty neat to come in here and see. And uh, back in the day, in the 1800s, there was a mine here called the Mugion Mines. And this is the Mugion Mountains here. And the mines were very successful, and because so, a community called Graham, Graham, New Mexico, grew around it to eventually have about 200 residents. And then eventually busted, of course. And because so, everything here started to fall apart. And eventually the National Forest Service put together a program to install these really cool suspension bridges through this canyon. And um, the bridges and catwalks are, are mounted to the side of the canyon wall. And it goes back a couple of miles. It's just a very beautiful place. And I'm here on a Monday and uh, in the parking lot there was only one other car and then there was a national forest truck but um it's a paved walkway it goes all the way back into this canyon and then eventually you find yourself walking on these catwalks which i'll show you here in a moment but a uh, really beautiful place and this is probably about i would say 30 to 40 miles north of the town of gila which is where i'm staying and then I'm going to go a little bit further north from here, eventually when I'm done here, to the ghost town called Mugion. So that should be pretty cool. Man, it's just so beautiful in here. Definitely feels like fall. Even though, of course, it's December. <laughs> look at this. Oh, look at that. Look at that. How oh, cool. I always found this place to be pretty peculiar when I saw it on the maps and did some research on it. I'm kind of surprised that the Forest Service would invest so much money in building these catwalks. And they go all the way back into this canyon. Just really extraordinary. Check this out. I mean, look at that. Those steel beams are suspending the catwalk and are anchored to either side of the canyon. Boy, I'm glad I grabbed my jacket. It's pretty cold through this narrow canyon. You figure with the running stream down below and a narrow canyon with about, I would say about 800 to 1,000 foot wall on either side. The breeze is blowing through here pretty chilly. Look at that anchor and the steel beam going all the way across to the other side of the canyon. Still some remnants here of the old mines. 
Move on, shall we? I think we're gonna head up to the town of Mugion now, which is supposed to be a really cool little ghost town. washed out here. All right, well, we arrived in Mugion. And I was reading an article about how one time there was a flash flood that came down through here and destroyed a few things. But uh, what a cool little town. Check this out. You can see the stone wall here. That's, I'm sure, in case water comes rushing down this canyon. Look at that. What a cool place that is. Looks like an old brothel or something. Well, that town's always fascinated me ever since I researched it a couple of years ago. A pretty cool little town. It's very, very quiet. Nobody's outside. I walked around that entire town by myself and not a soul around. I did see some guy in a woodworking shop. That's about it. Now I've got the long drive home. Got to climb over this windy mountain road all the way back to the main highway and then drop about... I'd say about 45 miles back down to Gila to get back to my cabin. I think that'll be it for the day. Well, that was quite a day. I came back after that long day of driving and hiking and took a nap and ended up falling asleep for three hours. I was supposed to go outside and enjoy a campfire with uh, the hosts here, but I just uh, fell asleep. I needed some sleep, I guess. Really beautiful area out here. Um, I've always been really intrigued by this area. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of research and reading about Aldo Leopold, and um, some of you might know that name, but uh, Aldo Leopold is, uh, I guess, largely considered sort of the grandfather of the environmental movement in the United States. Early on in his career, back in probably the 1920s, he was in charge of the national forests of the Southwest. And um, <clears throat> he was very intrigued by this region I'm in right now, uh, the Gila region, Gila Mountains and the Mugian Mountains and all of that. And uh, he had seen that a lot of the land was, uh, a lot of the wild land was disappearing to ranches, to mining, to whatever. And so 
he played an instrumental role in working with the National Forest Service to preserve a lot of this region as a wilderness, the Gila Wilderness Area. And because so, that was the first wilderness area in the United States. And frankly, I think that was probably the first designated wilderness area in the world. Um, generally, the United States leads in in sort of those kinds of initiatives. And and uh, the Gila Wilderness was was definitely the first wilderness area in the United States. And of course, as many of you know, or most of you know, there's a lot of wilderness areas around the United States now. And um, there's a number of designated wilderness areas in other parts of the world as well. But uh, pretty interesting. Uh, after, after he left the Forest Service, Aldo Leopold ended up moving to Wisconsin and working for the Univ- University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he lived, I think it was maybe north of Madison. I'm not exactly sure. But um, his most recognized work was done there. And uh, he <clears throat> he published a book called The Sand County Almanac, which uh, for environmental people, uh, people who um, are uh, very interested in protecting nature and all of that, that book, The Sand County Almanac, is sort of considered a Bible, if you will. And it's um, it's an account of his work on his property there. He bought he bought um, agricultural land in Wisconsin. Of course, many of you know Wisconsin is largely agriculture. And he bought that land and he returned it to a wild marshland. And um, the San County, County Almanac is his account of that. Beautiful book. But uh, Aldo Leopold uh, has been pretty influential in the Southwest as well in the Midwest, both of which are regions that I have spent a great deal of time and came from. As many of you know, I grew up in Wisconsin. I also found out just recently that um, John Muir grew up in Wisconsin. I I had no idea, or at least he spent a certain amount of time in Wisconsin on a farm near Madison as well. So I don't know, maybe uh, maybe they're naturalist philosophies rubbed off on me somewhere along the line. But, uh, you know, my stepbrother, John, um, introduced me to a lot of this. He's much older than I am. And he introduced me to a lot of, uh, these, I guess, philosophies on, on life. And of course he grew up in Wisconsin as well. And in fact, he was a fifth grade elementary school teacher for a long time. And he led an initiative adjacent to his elementary school to return, some land to uh, natural, I think natural grassland or natural marshland. So he sort of followed suit in what Aldo Leopold was doing with the San County Almanac. Anyhow, uh, really interesting for me to be out here and experiencing all of this and exploring this region and and, uh, finding sort of that connection to Leopold and uh, and all of that. This is also a really well-known region for Geronimo. In fact, uh, there's uh, a monument for Geronimo south of here, and um, he played an important role in this region as well, as well as the Apache, uh, the Apache uh, people. <sighs> you know, if most of you that watch my channel. You might recall a video that I did where I was with my friend Brian and we drove over the top of Engineers Pass in Colorado. It was a couple of years ago. I was in the Subaru Outback. Well, while I was on that trip, I was reading a book called Fire Season, which is written by a guy named Philip Connors. And uh, Fire Season is uh, the account of um, Philip's experience manning a fire tower for, I think, something like six seasons here in the Gila. And uh, from what I understand, he's from the East Coast, but he lives in Silver City. Boy, it'd be really cool if I could somehow connect with him and interview him about his book for this this episode, but I might need to have prepared that much, much earlier in advance. Who knows? Anyway, I think, um, I think I'm going to hit the hay and get up early and maybe do a hike or something like that. So until tomorrow, good night.
thought I'd take a little walk down the stream bed here. Just enjoy the leaves on the ground and walking through the leaves. When you're in the southwest, you don't really get the changing of the seasons as often or as much or as extreme as a lot of places in the country. So this kind of thing kind of puts you into the, the feeling of fall, even though it's winter. So I'd like to talk vehicles for a few minutes. But before I talk vehicles, I want to get a few things off my chest about my channel. So I know a lot of you discovered my channel because I drive a Subaru, or you discovered my channel because I drive a Ram truck with a slide-in camper, or you discovered my, my channel because, you know, whatever other reason. But at the end of the day, my channel's not about vehicles. My channel is about inspiring the adventurous to venture out. It's about outdoor adventure and getting people inspired to get outside. And uh, it really doesn't matter the mode that you or I take. It's, it's not about the vehicles. It's not about the equipment. Though I do feature equipment and I do talk about my equipment, I am a very utilitarian person, um, the right tool for the job. And if there's anything that I know for absolutely sure is that my life is always changing. Change is constant. And so if I decide that a Subaru Outback doesn't serve my, my needs for the tool of the job, I might get rid of that. If my truck or my truck camper um, doesn't meet the needs or if I have to sell it for other reasons, um, it is what it is. And if I ended up just not even having a vehicle and I'm, I'm uh, walking across the United States like Forrest Gump, well, so be it. I hope that you stay a subscriber and a viewer of my channel for the outdoor adventure experience, um, regardless of what I'm driving or paddling or pedaling or flying or whatever. So that's, that's probably the most important thing I wanted to get off my chest. But anyhow, um, let's talk about vehicles for a minute. As I mentioned a second ago, I'm very utilitarian. And so for me, if it's not the right tool for the job, it doesn't stick around. And um, also, because my life is constantly changing and I'm, I'm open to and uh, forthcoming with the changes that need to be made in my life without hesitation or f too much fear, uh, I'll make changes as needed. And so uh, you might have heard... Uh, through the grapevine that I sold my slide-in truck camper. And, uh, you know, I actually did. I sold my slide-in truck camper recently, uh, the one that I just got in June to put in the back of my 2020 Ram Rebel 1500 truck. I didn't really want to sell the slide-in truck camper, but I more or less had to. Um, I own some real estate and... Um, some pretty major changes have gone on in my life in November. And uh, the partner that I had in that real estate decided that they wanted their money out of the real estate and 
uh, the ability for them to purchase property somewhere else. I think a vacation home somewhere. And so I had to basically pay her back. And in order to do that, I had to, I didn't really have that much cash on hand. So I had to look at my assets and I had to liquidate something. And the thing that made the most sense to liquidate was the truck camper because they're very sought after. And um, I was able to unload it pretty quickly. And I knew that because they're very sought after, somebody would be willing to pay cash. And so I put it up for sale on Expedition Portal and sold it pretty quickly. And I was able to take those, those proceeds and pay off my real estate partner. So she could go about her business doing whatever it is she wanted to do. So that's that. Um, I decided after selling the truck camper to hold off on buying anything to replace it. In other words, another slide-in camper or something like that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, one of the there's a lot of pros and cons to the slide-in truck camper. Um, probably more pros than cons. But one of the things about it that I thought was kind of a con was uh, the fact that it's a soft-sided pop-up. And when you're taking it to places where there's a lot of wildlife, like grizzly bears and things like that, you have to be more cautious and careful with something like that. Well, you know, I mean, I've camped on the ground amongst grizzly bears in in a tent before and um you know it is what it is when you're backpacking but um when you're carrying around a lot of food and you're carrying around around a lot of things with a lot of scent having a slide in truck camper that has a pop-up soft-sided pop-up um isn't really ideal so i decided to hold off on that now i do intend next summer in the summer of 2021 to spend the summer traveling around and continuing my pursuit to look for land. And in order to be able to do that, I decided I need to have something that I could live comfortably in and work comfortably in. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting for some new model uh, types of off-road overland vehicles to come out, I decided to purchase a 2017 um, Sprinter Camper. And now it's not a camper van, it's a Sprinter chassis with a, um, a Winnebago body. So it's smaller it's, uh, than, than a typical RV. It's a Class B. It does get wider on the side than the width of the, uh, of the chassis. And um, it does have one pop-out on the side. So it's basically a small diesel Sprinter RV. And I intend to pull behind it something that I can use as an overland vehicle for short weekender types of, types of trips. And so I'm, I'm doing that temporarily for the next probably year to year and a half, maybe two years max, um, because I'm waiting for some other, other vehicles to hit the market that I've found to be very interesting. For instance, uh, Winnebago has a new vehicle coming out called the Echo. Uh, it's on a Ford Transit chassis, and uh, it's four-wheel drive, and it's a four-season off-road RV. And so I'm, I'm considering something like that, but I don't want to be the first person on the market buying one because there's usually a lot of issues to work out, a lot of bugs and things like that. And I might prefer to wait a year or two and see if I can get something like that used. But in the meantime, I have purchased a Sprinter camper and uh, it has a 5,000 tow rating. And um, it's got a gross vehicle weight rating of over 15,000 pounds. And um, I do intend to pull something behind it to use for my weekender trips with a rooftop tent on it. Now, what will that be? Well, it's probably not going to be the Subaru because the Subaru is all-wheel drive and you cannot put that on all fours and pull it behind anything. You'll destroy it. And I don't want to throw that onto a flatbed trailer because that'll be over my gross vehicle weight rating. So I'm hoping to be able to use my Ram 1500 and pull that behind the Sprinter. And uh, we'll see how that goes, how tight I am to the vehicle weight ratings. And if I do that, then I'll probably throw a overland rack on the bed and throw my iCamper SkyCamp Mini on top of that rack. And I'll have an off-road overland weekender vehicle to get up into the mountains and so forth. And the, uh, the Sprinter Camper will then be considered more or less my base camp if you will, a comfortable place to live um, over the whole summer and a comfortable place to work on my laptop 
where I feel like I can still live my life as I normally do, but from um, from an RV. That will not be a full-time camper. It's only going to be a part-time uh, living quarters, uh, predominantly over the summer, for me to go find somewhere to live and a piece of land to buy and, and that sort of thing. I'm still leaning toward moving up toward um, uh, Montana. I love the Big Fork area. I love Glacier National Park and Flathead Lake and uh, Whitefish Lake and all of that up there. So, And, of course, I like being really close to the border of Canada, and hopefully with the current situation in the world, the borders will open up again sometime soon, and maybe by next summer I'll be able to enjoy going up into Canada. So that's pretty much the case with the vehicles right now. But I do want to stress that if you're on my channel watching videos because you love Subarus and you don't see me creating Subaru videos and you ask, when am I going to create more Subaru videos? Or if you're on my channel because I have a Ram truck, a full-size Overland truck, and you're asking me, how come I'm not, I'm not creating more uh, Ram truck videos? I, I guess my answer to you would be that my channel's not really about the vehicle. It's about the experience. And I use those vehicles to create the experience. And so I hope that regardless of what I do, whether I keep the Subaru, I get rid of the Subaru, I keep the truck, I get rid of the truck, I keep the RV or I get rid of the RV, it doesn't matter. I hope that you'll stay a subscriber to my channel for the sake of being inspired to get out there and see the world and experience nature and love it the way that I do. Welcome to Silver City, New Mexico. College town. There's the university right there. I just um, stopped off here at the Gila Ranger Station to pick up a map, but I'm heading into an area here going straight north to eventually get up to the Gila Cliff Dwellings. And just adjacent to the Gila Wilderness is the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Area. It looks like this is going to be a beautiful day and a beautiful drive, and I'm really looking forward to getting up here and uh, doing a little exploring up here in. Um, in the cliff dwelling area as well as some of these other areas. It's, this could be a really great day. This is really a great thing for me to be able to do. Come here and get into the middle of the wilderness area. There's a sliver of highway that winds up through the middle of the wilderness area to get to this dwelling. And it was a long, long, long winding highway drive which would be awesome on a motorcycle but uh they're only open for another hour so i was fortunate to get up here and get out here and experience this it should be really nice What a beautiful valley, right here in the heart of the Gila Wilderness. They got all these built-in ladders here, so you can actually take a tour of this entire space without touching anything. Brilliant. Just amazing. I mean, I just can't believe these arches and how enormous this cave is. And look at this, the cave, this is the second section. And there's actually a, uh, I guess a monolith holding up the wall over there. And then it opens up to a whole nother room over there. There's three rooms here. Oh, 
You wonder what that little area was over there. That might have been a fireplace or something. But it's uh, definitely a little storage room or fireplace. Doubt it's a pit toilet. <laughs> truly remarkable here is that what I'm walking on is more than likely the main corridor thoroughfare that the native people who lived here used as their as their commuting routes <laughs> and uh, you know all the way down both ends of this canyon there's amazing almost almost complete buildings still available to, to view and, and I love the fact that um, the National Monument has built these ladders up to climb up and be able to see over the walls without touching the walls. Really, really amazing. What a wonderful place to come visit. So there's a third room way back there. And I don't know how you get there. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to go back there because it's closed off. But there's no door down here to get to that room. So what I'm thinking is that there used to be a vega here. And this was probably a floor. And my guess is that there was a ladder up. And there was a way to get over to that room from a second floor. Or something like that because there's no other entrance to that room way over there so the gila cliff dwelling was built over 700 years ago by the mugion people mugion is spelled m-o-g-o-l-l-o-n it's pronounced mugion and the mugion people actually had a quite an influence over the Southwest. In fact, in Arizona, the state of Arizona is divided uh, two thirds, one third by the Colorado Plateau. And the Colorado Plateau takes up the northern part of the state. And uh, there's a drop off about, I'd say about two to 3,000 feet in elevation that uh, drops to the lower elevations of Arizona. And that rim there across the state, as I've talked about many times and camped on many times and shared with all of you is called the Muggy on Rim. So uh, the Mugion people definitely had some influence here. So the documentation here says that the families of the Mugion people eventually left here around 1300. And uh, the legacy still lives on, though, in the Pueblo people. The Pueblo people of the area that still survive today uh, actually can trace their ancestry all the way back to the Mugion people. Looks like a pretty rainy morning out there this morning. I woke up around four o'clock this morning. It was raining pretty hard, pattering on the roof. Rained all the way up until about 7.30. Just finally stopped. You know, even though it's raining, I'm still pretty happy about that because this region hasn't had a lot of rain. In fact, Marcus was telling me that this region hasn't had rain since probably uh, maybe October. It's now December, maybe even earlier than that, maybe even in September. It was a, a pretty solid downpouring, so I think it certainly soaked the ground up really well. Marcus just came by and asked me if I wanted to ride with him 
and his Polaris up to the top of the hill behind the cabin because there's some snow on the mountains. So I thought it'd be pretty cool to go up there and see that. So the long-term plan would be to maybe add a, a few cabins around where the, the fire pit is in that area around there. So that are you not sure yet? Well, we, we're not sure. We may turn that into a garden or possibly uh, alpacas still seems appealing. Although I don't know anything about alpacas. So we'll, just, <laughs> we'll see how that works. It's, it's all a learning experience now. Well, the whole <laughs> thing is a learning experience from what I'm used to, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, there isn't too much I'm comfortable doing here, but we we seem to be... You're getting to, by. Yeah, getting Slowly by. Slowly but surely. Yeah. You said it's all a learning process and an exciting adventure. The nice thing about the, the clients that we've had here, everybody, it, it almost feels like not a, having a family member come, but everybody's very relaxed and there's not, it's not like having a client. It's almost like having people just coming to hang out and stay. There's yeah. no high maintenance people and there's not everybody wants the same as we do really yeah. they just want to relax and enjoy things and if Simple something living. isn't a hundred percent that's not the end of the world to people which right it's kind of nice because when you come from the city you get used to everything being perfect and we don't really need perfect do we in reality no so we don't we think we do but... I think what I want to know is go back through the story a little bit about how you found this place, why you even came out here in the first place, and what possessed you then to drop everything that you were doing back in Houston uh, and still, come out here. Still working on that one. <laughs> <laughs> we came out, um, oil and gas industry was quiet for me, so it didn't seem a lot of point sitting around in Houston. Um, we wanted to find somewhere. We came over for a month. Um, Honestly, finding it was more by accident because at the time there wasn't too many options available for us to come for a month. So um, this was one of them. So we looked and I, I kind of almost went ahead and just booked it and then said, oh, by the way, we're going to New Mexico. <laughs> so you did. I, I, I kept asking him. I was like, once we got here, I was like, babe, how'd you find this place? Like, really, how'd you find this place? And he was like, it was the only place to open for about a month. And... And we booked it. Totally and you wanted to get away for a whole month. Yes. Yeah. And yes. what made you decide on New Mexico? Just You just said... I drove through it once and liked it. So I thought I'd like to come and see more of it. But <laughs> I didn't drive through anywhere near here. So it was kind of... It, it was a so fluke. It was pretty it, random. It, it yes. was so random. Yeah, and then uh, this whole thing fell into our laps, basically. Because we had wanted to get out of Houston for quite some time. 
And we went, uh, you know, we had put the house on the market and we were like, okay, we're going to move to Colorado. And then we decided on this place called Golden Colorado. And we're like, okay. And then the house didn't sell. So then we ended up, you know, redoing a lot of things ourselves. And, and uh, he's on six weeks on, six weeks off most of the time. Well, then it kind of just went hush hush. Uh -huh. <laughs> after he got stuck in Saudi Arabia for quite a long time. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And so then he finally gets home, and then we start looking at, uh, you know, places to just kind of get away after he recovers a little bit. and From the world travels yeah. for work. Yeah. That, just a, life in general, really. Yeah, interesting I mean, the, start to the year, really. So um, you just road tripped it up here and checked in? And, yeah. Yeah. I think I, yeah, then I went away to work again, got stuck for a lot longer than planned, and... Then kind of got back and when I'm at home, there's no reason to be at home. It's just an empty building. So we yeah. thought, well, we might as well go and see something. And it was, it was here. Yeah. yeah. It and just, yeah. In our laps. So how long kind of... were you here before you found out that it was for sale? So we went up. So coming down after you go off to Hooker's Loop and right before the main sign down, down the hill right there, um, there's this gorgeous, gorgeous view. I mean, where I think where you went today to see. Oh, sure. The, yeah. So, I mean, just abs majestic. And we saw a, a for sale sign and we were like, huh, just curious, <laughs> just curious. And so then through that realtor, we ended up seeing that this place was for sale as well. I knew from like the get go, I was ecstatic. Marcus needed to see that for himself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that watch my channel that would be interested in doing what you're doing. And so I think it's really cool to talk to you guys about how it came to be. What kind of plans do you have for it in the future? That kind of thing. I mean, now we're here, we're, we're going to give three, four, five months and kind of let it run as is. Because like I said to you, the business is, is running. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It, people are coming without us really asking them to which is fantastic i mean we couldn't have asked for more really it's a lot of getting used to from a lifestyle standpoint i mean we have a lot of grand ideas about the place but we're also sensible enough that we're gonna keep those under check because i want to see how it works as it is mm -hmm. before we go and mm -hmm. change the world because <laughs> yeah maybe no need uh, don't well, fix no, right, yeah, broken. Yeah. that's, that's, that's exactly true. something that was told to me if it's if it works then mm -hmm. leave it yeah i mean if at the moment i think the only thing we could do with is another two or three cabins and yeah. if it's that simple then yeah and you've got the room for it. Yeah, yeah, at some point in the next six months, a year, we'll probably have yeah. two or three more cabins. Very nice. And I, I also don't want to turn it into a small town mm -hmm. with right. 20 <laughs> cabins where you're all, you know, sitting on top of each other. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be something that still embraces the peacefulness that we have at the minute. The Definitely. laid back atmosphere. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Casual, yeah. very casual. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you have to be adaptable to yeah. anything yeah. and any, I mean, we've... Like, the, like this morning, uh, somebody was stuck. <laughs> yes, the Tesla got stuck up the road as, after it rained. And you pulled, um, you pulled it out with the Polaris? No, we did. Well, a <laughs> little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it was a muddy, muddy morning. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I mean, every day you wake up and something different happens that you're not used to. And Debbie said something to me, the old owner's wife, and uh, said that it's New Mexico. Just it, it is what it is. Just... Yeah, Roll with that's it. what happens here basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's one of the more remote states too. I mean. And we're yeah. in probably the most remote part of it yeah. as well. Honestly, yeah. I mean, the local town has a permanent population of about four or five hundred people. So I mean, it's right. well, we're on the so. back door of Gila. So through our two private trails, you only get access to through staying at the cabins. Um, you know, we're right on Gila National Reserve, which is. Yeah. Three million acres. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> amazing. So, you know, if you're up for a hike, <laughs> yeah. come on down. <laughs> wow, truly extraordinary. I was heading home this morning and climbed up out of the valley to leave the ranch to head home, and I got up to the top of the hill, and there's this just magnificent view of the Mugion Mountains covered in snow. And as you recall, we were up in the town of Mugion early on in this episode, so that town is probably totally blanketed in snow right now. Really beautiful out here. 
the air is just so clean and crisp after this rainfall that we had and the sun's out just my favorite my favorite kind of weather after a rainstorm everything's just alive and and just refreshed and uh glistening with water in the sun really wonderful and if i look northeast here i can see into the gila wilderness area the ranch butts right up against the gila wilderness area really a wonderful place if you haven't spent much time in new mexico or if you have and you haven't spent time in the southwest part of the state Definitely come down here to the Silver City area, and if you do, I definitely recommend you come out and spend some time at the New Mexico Cabin Rentals here on Double E Ranch. Marcus and Holly are really wonderful hosts, just really, really great people. Just want you to have a really good time and come out here and find what it, whatever it is you're looking for. Definitely have a link down below in the description if you're interested in learning more about the cabin rentals. You know, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to wrap this up and. Just encourage you to become a subscriber if you haven't become one. And of course, you know, uh, every once in a while I post videos. And if you want to be notified, definitely click the notification bell. And I'm always looking for support. So go on forexpedition.com. There's a lot of really cool things in the store that you can buy. And as always, if you'd like to become a member of Team Forex, we're definitely growing the membership. And uh, we'll have the membership portal going live here soon. Definitely go on forexpedition.com slash join to learn more about that. Until the next time, take care.